Nature Revisited, the podcast. My name is Stefan Van Norden, and thank you for joining me for this episode with Roger De Silvestro, Return of the Bison. Roger has worked as a writer, communications director, and book editor for wildlife conservation groups such as the National Audubon Society, Defenders of Wildlife, and the National Park Foundation. Roger is also the author of 11 books, which include In the Shadow of Wounded Knee and Theodore Roosevelt in the Badlands. Roger joins me today from his home in Virginia to talk about the return of the bison. So Roger, thank you for joining me on Nature Revisited. It is truly a pleasure to have you on the podcast. So when did you first become interested in bison? I've had this fascination with bison since I was a child. In fact, I'm sitting here in my office and there's this bison over there that I won throwing darts at an amusement park back when I was about five years old, five or six. And I chose this buffalo and I still have that after all these years. For me, it's been this lifelong interest in bison. As we know, your book is about how the bison has returned from the brink of extinction. But before we get to that, I would like to ask one question that speaks to why. The bison is a majestic animal that once ruled the Great Plains of North America by the millions and who roamed freely from Canada to Mexico before their freedom was taken from them, but whose spirits still touch us today. So who were the players that brought the bison to the obscenely tragic point of extinction, to where there was just a few dozen bison left by 1880? Well, there was any number of parties that were participated in this destruction, which was so incredible. Somewhere from 30 to 60 million bison were roaming just in the West in the Plains country. There were many bison in eastern United States, even around Washington, D.C., and up in upstate New York. Starting really in the the 18th century, bison in the eastern part of the United States were slowly pushed, pushed out by the colonists so that they were more or less extinct by the very early 1800s, east of the Mississippi. But there were still millions of them out on the plains. You had sport hunters who were uncontrolled. There were no game laws at that time. Hunters who would come out and kill hundreds of them just and just leave them lying there and rotting. People on railroads would shoot bison that were running alongside the trains. So those animals were just shot mercilessly and, and wasted. And then you have the hide hunters and the meat hunters who were killing the animals for market. They were shipped to the east and west coasts. Even the Indian people got caught up into the hide trade. So they, too, were, were starting to kill bison at a level that was great enough to reduce the animals' numbers in the long run. And then to top that off, you had U.S. government recognizing that the Plains Indians were dependent on the bison for survival and that if we killed off the bison, we would essentially be wiping out the Indians' commissary because they knew it was going to ultimately undermine the Indian population. And then, on top of that, you had the politicians who refused to do anything about it. You had uncontrolled destruction and no attempt at all to protect these animals, and we know where that led. So that did lead to some influential people who came to the defense of the bison. So can you share with us some of those people, and what were their motivations? People such as George Bird Grinnell, William T. Hornaday, John Lacey, and Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt, of course, is 
no surprise because he was an avid wildlife uh, and habitat protector, but he was also an avid hunter. His first contact with bison was when he went out to North Dakota in 1883 to kill a buffalo. And at that point, people like Roosevelt, people who knew about what was going on, were pretty much assured that these animals were on their way to extinction. So he actually wanted to kill one before they were all gone. And that was pretty much true of a lot of the early conservationists. And in fact, Roosevelt started a ranch out in what is now North Dakota. And at one point, he had an opportunity to shoot an elk, and he did. And he thought, this is probably the last elk in this entire area, and I have, I have killed it. And he also shot other vanishing species, you know, black bears in that area. He had to hunt for about three weeks before he got a decent shot at a buffalo. Later, he began to realize, however, that we were wiping out the wildlife and the, the habitat throughout the United States. He knew this partly from his experiences in North Dakota at his ranch, and he saw the changes that were happening. His concern wasn't an ecological concern. It wasn't that he thought, well, we, sh we need to protect these intact ecosystems. It was that he was afraid that if these animals disappeared, he wouldn't have the opportunity to take his sons, not his daughters, but his sons, uh, out hunting. And this was a concern of a lot of the other bison hunters. But it wasn't universally true. George Bird Grinnell was a, a biologist uh, and a paleontologist, and he had spent some time in the 1870s out west. He knew that the bison were going to be extinct within a matter of years. He was pleading with the government to protect those animals. But, of course, that all fell on deaf ears. He and Roosevelt later became friends and associates. They founded a group called the Moon and Crockett Club, which still exists today. The goal initially was to get better protections for Yellowstone National Park and for bison. At that time, which was in the late 1880s and into the 1890s, Yellowstone was the last bastion. And there were only from 25 to 100 was all that was left of the wild bison. William T. Hornaday, whom you mentioned, he was a taxidermist, actually, and he worked for the Smithsonian at one point. And he was sent out west and told to kill everyone that he could find so they would have new specimens in the Smithsonian Museum because the specimens they had were old and in terrible condition. And he ended up killing about 22 bison of all ages. He mounted them and it created some exhibits. While he was putting this exhibit together, he met there to Roosevelt. Roosevelt was everywhere in wildlife conservation. He was one of the driving forces behind starting the Bronx Zoo. And he brought Hornaday in as the director, and he promised that he would let Hornaday uh, raise captive bison there and ultimately release them back into the wild. Hornaday was more what we might think of as a naturalist now. He did a massive study on the bison and its extermination in the 1880s, which is still a classic today. And when he later became involved with the Bronx Zoo, he and Roosevelt and Grinnell and, and other participants partnered to get bison restored into the wild. Uh, you also mentioned Don Lacey, who's one of my heroes in a sense. It, Lacey was from Iowa. He was a Civil War veteran. It was in the House of Representatives in the U.S. Congress. He was behind a lot of the key wildlife laws, including the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which protected birds from market hunting for feathers. He also was an advocate for bison, a great ally for Roosevelt and Grinnell in getting stronger protection for Yellowstone National Park. So why was the U.S. military, the first cavalry, sent into Yellowstone Park on August 17, 1886? Well, ironically, Yellowstone National Park was the world's first national park, and it was created on March 2nd, 1872. However, as of the 1880s, Congress had never passed a law or put into the law that created the park any wording that protected its resources. People were still cutting down trees, taking rock formations and things, selling them as souvenirs, and they were killing wildlife. Poachers were still taking down the last bison. By the late 1880s, a hunter who poached a, a bison in Yellowstone could probably sell that head for $300, which was about six months' pay for, say, a ranch hand. This was a lucrative business. The civilian 
administrators who ran the park, they could, in theory, arrest them, but they would have to let them go because there were there was no law saying that these activities were illegal. After about three years of destruction of wildlife in the park, including elk and bears, the Secretary of the Interior asked that the military take over and administer the parks. The officer in charge had actually been out west when the bison were, were in the millions, and he knew what, what had been lost. And he took very seriously the role of protecting these animals in Yellowstone. But he complained that he couldn't really do anything about it. He would arrest the poacher, confiscate the poacher's wagon, weapons, and so on. The poacher's friends would then say, well, those things were actually theirs. They had loaned them to him. So he would have to give that material back to the poacher's friends. They would restore it to the poacher, who, of course, would be let out of jail as soon as word came back from Washington that they couldn't press charges against the poacher. And this happened again and again. At one point, George Bird Grinnell, who we mentioned earlier, was the editor of a magazine called Forest and Stream, which was one of the most powerful voices for conservation in the 1880s and 1890s. One of his reporters was in Yellowstone when a poacher named Howell, who was considered one of the worst, was caught red-handed with five dead bison that he had shot. He was put in jail accordingly and then had to be released. This reporter wrote up a series of stories on this situation, and the public was so outraged that they insisted that Yellowstone be given protection. A law was, in fact, finally passed and signed in 1894 that made it illegal to damage the natural resources within Yellowstone National Park. How did Yellowstone become the refuge of the bison? The last of the big herds was roaming around up in Montana in the early 1880s, 1882, 1883. The government decided to let the Indian tribes on reservations there go out and hunt all the bison they wanted. And of course, the usual bison hide hunters went out and after this herd. By the end of 1882, that herd was wiped out. That was more or less the end of the free roaming bison. Somehow up in Yellowstone, which isn't even prime bison habitat because it's high elevation and get, has a very bitter winter. That was the last refuge for the bison, mainly because not many people went up there at that time. So you have this handful of bison that survived in this supposedly protected area. So eventually the, the last of the wild bison were just there in Yellowstone. It's not entirely accurate to say they were the last, but in any functional or biologically meaningful way, those were the last of the wild bison. So do you think the destiny of the bison is still connected to Yellowstone? Yeah, because that's probably where you get the largest bison herd in federal management. Studies suggest that Yellowstone could support about 10,000 bison. When you talk about how many bison there are in Yellowstone, this number can fluctuate drastically within a year. The state of Montana has kind of a, a thing against bison and has agents who will kill the bison if they wander outside of the park. And then also the bison that stay in the park rather than get shot, oftentimes during the hard winter, they'll die from the stresses of, of cold and lack of food. So that you might have 4,500 bison in the summer, you might lose 2,000 of them that are shot and another 1,000 that die of starvation in the park. But nevertheless, those are still, that's still the largest and probably most viable bison herd. A lot of the other herds that the federal government and also state governments have on protected lands, there might be only 300 bison, and that's not enough to sustain a herd in the long term. Eventually, you're going to get inbreeding and various other problems. You have to have a minimum of about 1,000 bison. Yellowstone is about the only place where that happens. So what makes the bison so different? And what kind of environmental impact does a bison have? What's often called a keystone species, one that the rest of the their ecosystem depends on for environmental or, or ecosystem health. In the days when bison were extremely numerous, you know, millions of them out there, herds on winter days, you could sometimes spot a herd that was out of sight behind hills or something just by the water vapor that from their condensed breath that rose up into the air. You could also hear them, the noises they would, the bulls made during mating season 
from miles away. This was an animal that was so so numerous that it was bound to have ecological effects. We know now that they have a grazing pattern that supports the growth of grass. The bison also, with their hooves, all that walking, all that kicking up of dust that they did in the past and that they still do, will help move nutrients through the soil. Plus, you have their droppings, which put nutrients back into the soil. In addition, the bison like to wallow in a certain area. They'll lie on the ground and roll around and create a small depression, which then fills with water during the spring when the rains come. Those little ponds, which are ephemeral, they disappear quickly. But while they exist, they provide water for animals and plants. So you can imagine that if you had, you know, 30 million or 50 million bison roaming around, all of them out there engaging in, in these activities, you'd have a much more fertile grassland, and a much more vital ecosystem, thanks to the various ecological services that bison provide. The problem nowadays is that their numbers are so scant that some biologists will say that as a species, they are biologically extinct because there are no longer enough of them to fulfill that natural role. And that's kind of the tragedy of the bison and, and of what happened here. We look at this prairie and we think, wow, this is beautiful, it's wonderful. But if you examine it closely, you begin to realize it's ailing. Bison could indeed help to restore that system. As many have pointed out, the bison needs to roam. It needs to have its freedom, its wildness. So why is it that the bison is maybe the only wild North American animal that is not allowed its freedom? That's a very complex question. The former chief bison biologist at Yellowstone told me that one of the things we do have to consider in bison restoration is the needs of the people who actually live in the habitat with the bison. Clearly, you know, the bison is a bit of a conundrum because the bison live in herds. How does a herd of these huge animals, how does it cooperate and get along with people that are, have fences and domestic livestock and maybe crops? So that's the, the really grueling question here. What happens with an animal that's this size and lives in herds? Their populations can grow relatively fast. And it's not just bison that this is a question we have to ask. That's also true of elephants and giraffes, water buffalo in Southeast Asia, all across the globe. How do animals of that sort, how do they survive in the face of human development? I see the bison as almost a model for these other animals. Here in the United States, where we have a conservation ethic that dates back over a century, and we have a lot of money. If we can't do it, can they do it? Can African elephants be saved? Don't you think we are taking the wildness out of the bison if we continue on this path and simply reducing it to a domestic animal? Yeah, that's a huge question because there is that risk that we're going to turn them into a domestic animal. It'll end up being like a cow that they will lose some of their edge. In bison, the bulls will start getting really gr aggressive when they're about six years old. It's the aggression that makes the bison a survivor. So you have to wonder if the bulls aren't competing, what is that going to the bison's personality? That's a very serious question, and it's one that has not been resolved yet, whether or not these animals will become increasingly domestic. So how has... Indigenous groups been involved in the restoration of bison herds, and how has their perspective and relationship to bison made a difference? For the Plains Indians, bison were extremely important to them, not only for food, but also hides. The hides were used in building their teepees and making boats, and then the horns that were made into tools of various sorts. So their culture virtually couldn't survive without the bison or the buffalo. The Indians usually still call them buffalo. Do very much to the extinction of the bison. The Indians did begin to starve when the bison were all but wiped out. And that's what ultimately forced them to go to reservations. So for a long time, they were more or less divorced from the, the bison because just the way the reservations were administered, the Indians lost contact with the bison. 
They never lost the memory, though. So if you talk to a lot of tribespeople today, they will talk about how restoring the bison will restore the health of the Indian people, that the bison is still important to them spiritually. There was this long period where, from, I would say, the 1870s or 80s uh, on into the maybe the 1950s or 60s, when the Indians lost their contact with, with the bison. As things loosened up, the federal government started responding to tribal needs. There were tribes that wanted to get involved in bison management. I believe it was the Crow who were the first to actually acquire their own bison and start raising them. There is this group, the, the Intertribal Bison Council, that seeks to restore bison to the various reservations that want them. I have a whole chapter in my book on the Native American management of bison, several different examples of reservations where this is being done. Some of the tribes have talked about, you know, opening the reservation to tourism, including hunting or else camping out on the prairie. All of it seems based on a great spiritual respect for the bison and the sense that there is a link between Indian survival and bison survival, that these things were linked in antiquity and are still linked today. There's oftentimes they will speak of feeling of restored health and restored spirituality when they start reacquiring bison. Another issue is genetics. How does the fact that most bison have a cattle DNA in them, how does that affect the future of the bison? That's pretty scary. I can remember, I think, the day that I first heard that bison had maybe 3% cattle genes. For me, the bison is a, is almost a metaphor for wildlife conservation. You know, this animal that nearly went extinct, but that has struggled it's back into existence. So it's disappointing, too, to think, oh, I mean, I've never seen an actual wild bison. Well, at that time, the understanding was that the Yellowstone bison had no cattle genes. That idea persisted until about two or three years ago. But unfortunately, as our techniques for sorting through the DNA of various species have become more refined, some research found that, in fact, the Yellowstone bison do have a certain percentage of cattle genes. No bison that were tested anywhere have been free of cattle genes. So now you have to face that fact. But I did ask a geneticist who works for the Fish and Wildlife Service. She said, with the current techniques we have for measuring DNA, we can't necessarily say that it's 3% or 1%. We just know that there are cow genes in bison. So then the worry is, what are the implications of that? One biologist that I talked with, James Bailey, he seemed to feel that if we let the bison, you know, even the captive bison, if we don't take the wildness out of them, if we let them more or less live a natural life and let the bulls live for 20 years the way they're supposed to, ultimately those cattle genes will be, they will ultimately just be filtered out by natural selection. So that's one optimistic way to look at it. Another is, as somebody pointed out to me, is if you can look at a buffalo, watch its behavior and, and see how it looks, you can't really tell by looks or behavior that this animal has cattle genes, but maybe it's not significant at all. The main thing is to just keep it from happening again. So why has the bison not received what you term the tolerance that other wild animals have? The microcosm for that issue is Montana. There's a, a disease called brucellosis, which is found in a hoofed animals. Bison carry it, elk carry it, and cattle carry it. It causes an animal that has the disease to abort calves. A state has to be found to be brucellosis free or the USDA puts limits on the sale of their cattle. In Montana, there's been a great deal of concern that the bison carry brucellosis, which they do, Yellowstone bison. The ranchers out there have been opposed to letting the herd get too big. They would prefer that, that they not be there at all, seeing the bison as a, a threat and wanting to limit their numbers and their movements. The crux of the matter is that no instance of brucellosis being transferred from bison to cattle has ever occurred. Biologists out there have been fighting with the livestock people over this for years. The other ludicrousness of it is that the elk carry brucellosis, 
And they do mix with cattle during the time when cattle would be susceptible to getting it from the elk. So the bison are not a vector for this disease. The elk are. The problem is that a buffalo can get brucellosis. Its immune system can fight the brucellosis away, but it will still test positive. So a positive test from a buffalo could mean that you're looking at a bison that has had brucellosis. So you kill that animal and you're killing one of the animals that could in fact help reduce the occurrence of brucellosis uh, through its immune system. So it's, it's a very sticky issue out there. Now you've got people who want to bring these animals back. Uh, there's a group called American Prairie, which is buying up land or leasing land and trying to build up a million acre bison reserve. The ranchers see this as kind of turning back the clock and as a cultural insult to their whole way of life. So that's an, another issue. Whose hands hold the fate of the future of the bison? What organizations oversee them at present? Well, one of the main ones, of course, is the National Park Service. And also you have the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which has a number of national wildlife refuges that have bison on them. The Canadian government also has provincial parks that protect bison. In Canada, as in the U.S., you have ranchers who are leasing public lands from the Bureau of Land Management, and they're saying, well, we don't want bison on there. It's public wildlife that we all own is being forbidden on public land because the ranchers don't want them there. And the Bureau of Land Management is another agency that does have bison on some of its lands. And then you have the various state wildlife agencies and parks that have bison on them. For example, Custer State Park in South Dakota. All those various agencies have a, a huge, a huge impact. There's a main avenue for getting public policy related to bison management put into effect. It comes down to what, if the American people or the Canadian people or the Mexican people express support for these animals, then we might be able to have some progress in taking control of them out of the hands of a more limited group. So how do you think we should measure success in our efforts to return the bison in the future? Let me just mention Europe. That's something you rarely hear about the European bison. I look at Europe and I think it's just the future of the United States where there's almost no natural habitat left, where even the forests are really just manicured parks. In Europe, the bison was nearly wiped out. In the 1920s, they were down to just a couple of dozen. It's not the same species. It's a European animal. It looks a little different from the American bison. I talked to biologists there, and he doesn't really think they, they can recover because there's just nowhere to, to put them. He said with the bison living in herds and so on, and because they often conflict with farming interests, he doesn't see how you can possibly build a large population of bison. They just don't have the land in Europe. We do have the land in the United States that can do that. The potential exists there for us to do it. But I think as years go by, these large areas of prairie and national parks and so on are going to become increasingly hemmed in by development. Somehow we need to do something you know, a little bit more immediate. It really is the, the one species that really tests our commitment to, to wildlife. Do you think we can or will ever return the bison to its rightful place on the Great Plains? To where they're roaming freely and they're restored to fulfilling their ecological role? Yes. They're, they really are a plains or prairie species. A lot of it comes down to will we arrange habitat in a way that facilitates bison survival. One way to do that is to create corridors so that animals like bison, as well as uh, other species, wolves and grizzlies and so on, can move from one protected place to another. So that if you can get, create a corridor of protected land from Yellowstone to Glacier, and then from Glacier on into Canada on all the way up to the Arctic Circle, these species could begin to move around as they once did. Will we do it? We certainly can. We can do this. And the bison, we know, reproduce well. The bison, they're, they're resilient. The only thing holding them back is us 
shooting a thousand of them when they leave Yellowstone National Park and letting a thousand more of them starve to death. It's worthy really obstacle. If we would just recognize that and agree that we want to restore this amazing species, we've lost something incredible in the Great Plains. Most of us don't even know we lost something there. I also have a picture here on the side of one of my file cabinets of a 19th century locomotive plowing through a bison herd. If I look at that link there, there is the metaphor of wildlife conservation. We always have development plowing through habitat, through forests, through wetlands, through mountains, through rainforests. So the buffalo for me is that, is that metaphor. But it also shows that there is resilience in nature. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Roger De Silvestro and that you get the opportunity to read his book, Return of the Bison, and visit his website, rldsilvestro.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please share with friends, family, and colleagues. If you would like to share your thoughts or comments on this or any other episode, please email me at nordenpro at gmail.com. That's Norden, N-O-O-R-D-E-N-P-R-O at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. You can follow Nature Revisited on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and our website, nordenproductions.com. The music for Nature Revisited is Tim Buckley, Buzz and Fly. Nature Revisited is produced by Stefan Van Orden and Charles Gagan. And I hope you will join us for the next edition of Nature Revisited. And in the meantime, remember, we are nature. <laughs>